For us, it's been a question of how do you manipulate Chinese fears so that you change the risk calculus, right? So you say the status quo is actually risky. And because uh, China could live with the status quo for a long time. So uh, whenever we go on these, like the maximum pressure campaign that you've heard a lot about, you know, was, was starting to, to work in, in, in North Korea. And you have to be very careful. I mean, you, you have to credibly threaten military force without scaring your allies, right? But, but China was scared. Great Decisions is a uh, project of the Foreign Policy Association, and uh, they come up with eight topics per year, which every uh, local council, World Affairs Council, covers differently. We do it our way. Uh, they also come up with a really great book, which we sell at a wicked good discount. So uh, if you're interested in one, please uh, speak to the staff. Uh, it's only 15 bucks, and I have to say that the briefings are really good excellent and brief and very pithy. Uh, World Boston has a mission of fostering international engagement. One of the ways that we do that is by hosting uh, hundreds and hundreds of visitors who are guests here uh, for a brief time, several weeks, guests of the US State Department. And I'm so happy we have members of a delegation that's here in Boston here with us tonight. Uh, they are a group that's uh, looking at the topic of green energy in Vermont, Boston, Denver, San Diego. Uh, so I'm, I apologize ahead of time. I'll probably miss up, mess up the names, but um, I will try. Mr. Chi Pan, uh, Mr. Xiaowei Gao, um, and Ms. Yingwei. Um, and so we really welcome you and are glad that you're with us. So welcome to our Chinese visitors. And finally, the moment we've all been waiting for is the moment of Dan Blumenthal, who is the director of Asian Studies at the American Enterprise Institute. And we're really pleased that you've come up from DC to be with us. Uh, he focuses on East Asian security issues and Sino-American relations. Uh, he has both served and advised the US government on China issues for over a decade. From 2001 to 2004, he served as senior director for China, Taiwan, and Mongolia at uh, the Department of Defense. He also served as a commissioner on the congressionally mandated U.S.-China Economic and Security Review Commission uh, from 2006 to 2012, and then held the position of vice chairman in uh, 2007. Additionally, he served on the academic advisory board of the congressional U.S.-China Working Group. Dan received his B.A. from Washington University, his master's from Johns Hopkins, SAIS, I imagine. Um, and his JD from Duke Law School. So uh, we welcome Dan to World Boston. Thank you very much, and and also thank thanks to all of you for braving the weather and and making it here. I understand we attrited quite a few, but the brave, the few and the brave uh, and the tough made it, and uh, thank you very much. Um, so, I mean, this is a very big topic. China itself is a very big topic. I'm sorry I can't help too much with green uh, energy. That's not my field. I, I will say on the uh, areas of cooperation with the United States, the, the U.S. is creeping up there very high, not on the green side, but on the export of, of LNG uh, and shale gas and oil, we've become a uh, leading uh, exporter to China of, of, those, um, of those products, which is a big sea change in our relationship. Um, so let me just start with saying, you know, why, why would we care about knowing about Ch Chinese grand strategy? Uh, w one of the main reasons is the United States is committed in its national security policy, which is supported across the board on a bipartisan basis to quote unquote competing effectively uh, with, with China that, that uh, you know, we believe views us as its, as, as its chief rival and is, is trying to do things to diminish our, our traditional influence in the Asia Pacific region. Um, now rivalry does not mean conflict. I am not one of, uh, uh, these people, you know, there are recent books out, the Thucydides trap, and kind of argue that conflict is just inevitable. 
because there's a rising power, China, and an established power, the United States, and so history proves that, that always leads to conflict. I don't, I don't believe that. I believe rivalry can be managed. Uh, you know, I, I believe that rivalry also uh, can sit alongside, if uncomfortably, cooperation. I, me I mentioned energy cooperation, but there's so many other places where the United States and China uh, continue to cooperate. So rival it's, a, it's a mixed uh, kind of rivalrous plus cooperative relationship at the same, at the same time. Um, so, but first we have to understand, I think, before we can understand how we're going to have a strategy to compete uh, with, a, with a rival in certain areas, we have to understand what China's grand strategy is. Uh, and I think that uh, the current uh, president of China, and importantly, the party secretary that he calls himself, the Chinese Communist Party, it's still very important um, that uh, the general secretary, sorry, uh, it's very important uh, that, that, um, to know that he plays those dual roles as party head and as president. It's still a very Leninist uh, system. Um, has said, you know, that in, in one of his first speeches, my goal is national rejuvenation um, to, to take China back to its place of greatness, uh, civilizational greatness, uh, power greatness. It, 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 there's a strong belief in China that that's the natural order of things, and, and, and not without reason. The, um, the feeling in China, and history proves this out, is China was once, and for a long time, thousands of years, the dominant power in Asia. In the last 200 years, where uh, either the UK or Japan or the United States have been the dominant powers in Asia, in China's view, or in Chinese elite view, is an aberration that will pass with time. Um, a very small blip on the historic chessboard. Uh, so, okay, the statement's about national rejuvenation, national greatness, but you know, analyzing another country's uh, grand strategy, which is so important for U.S. policy and, and strategy making, because we so often don't take into account what the other country actually thinks and says. We, we, we assume countries think like we do. Uh, China certainly doesn't think like we do. China has a vast reserve of strategic history, thousands of years again, to draw upon. And, and even in modern times, uh, communist revolutionary history, Maoist history, and so on. And so uh, it would be a huge mistake for the United States to think, well, you know, they're doing exactly what we would do uh, or we did when we were a rising power. That's, that's, that's not right. But we still have to kind of bound this analysis and, you know, how what are the sort of structures you use to analyze a country's grand strategy? Well, obviously there's some immutables. There's the geography, right? That's number one, strategic geography. And China is traditionally a mass continental empire and still holds a lot of the territories that were conquered when it was an empire. Um, that's vastly important. If you think about the United States and its conduct of, of global strategy from its early times to now, the fact that it is a maritime power separated by, from the rest of the world by two oceans has a huge impact on how we think about the world. China never had that luxury. It has 14 continental land borders with 14 countries. Uh, so it is, it is a con it, it, one thing shaping the way it does strategy and thinks about it is the fact that it is still a continental power mostly uh, however, it's a continental power that has decided to go to sea, to become a maritime power as well, which is very difficult to do. Um, historically, we've seen uh, the Germans uh, try to do that in, it, in the turn of the uh, 19, uh, 20th century. A continental power is going to sea. You usually start to get your potential rivals nervous and excited when you do that, and that's arguably what's, what's happened. But China's uh, geography is such that it has one, only one coastline. Um, there's no other way out besides that one eastern seaboard. It's not true for the United States. It's not true for England. It's not true for Japan. China has one way out. And guess what? It is surrounded, if China, you know, in China's point of view, by U.S. allies and the U.S. Navy in order to get out from the continental eastern seaboard. So... Japan, uh, South Korea, 
Uh, Taiwan's a partner of the United States. I see some Taiwanese friends here that I know, but I've known for a while. Um, and um, uh, the Philippines and so on. And so if you're, if you're a Chinese strategist and you're looking out and saying, I want to break out into the oceans and become a great maritime power like all the other great maritime powers, you're having a somewhat of a difficult time breaking out because the U.S. Navy sits right there and the Japanese Navy sits right there and so on. And so you are concerned about things like the possible disruption of your oil supply or the possible disruption of your maritime trade. All those massive ports that China's built uh, because it grew much richer in the last 40 years sit on that one eastern seaboard. Um, so geography is an immutable. There's, there's no moving your country somewhere else, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's a continental power trying to go to sea. And it's, it's still, in many ways, a continental empire. Uh, so that is one key driver of the way it thinks about its, its strategy. Um, the other, of course, is that since the great uh, reform and opening, uh, when Deng Xiaoping took the country in a completely different direction from 1978 onwards uh, and started to experiment in certain places with capitalism and open markets and uh, sending many, many Chinese out to learn uh, about economics and business and finance and science and technology, uh, everything that created this boom um, we saw from the early 80s uh, until now um, has succeeded, but it's also given China the wherewithal to produce more power, as we say. It's produced a military. It's produced a military that in many ways, um, in, in many ways challenges the United States' advantages or its, its traditional advantages around the maritime approaches to China. So it has a very sophisticated now uh, remember, China doesn't have to compete with the United States globally. The U.S. is a global power with global responsibilities. China just has to compete with the United States on the military front uh, around China if it really wants to undermine the U.S. ability to do the traditional things it, it did in Asia, you know, keep the alliance safe, keep the, uh, the sea lanes open and, and the trade routes open and so forth. China has developed a formidable uh, coercive capability in, in its maritime and, and, and naval capabilities that it uses more often than it used to in uh, places you've re read about, like the South China Sea, uh, in and around Taiwan, in, ar in and around the East China Sea, increasingly into the Indian Ocean. It's developed a formidable missile force. Uh, it's catching up in certain parts of its military with the United States when it comes to its missiles programs and precision-guided uh, munitions and so forth. Certainly the smaller regional powers view China as a great military power, even if the United States is saying, you know, it's not quite a peer. You know, it's the smaller regional powers are certainly uh, concerned about the growth in, in Chinese power. So geography, the development of, of power and, and the ambition that, that drives that power and then the, 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 the fact that when you have more power, you usually have more ambition. Um, so those are, those are two things that really shape Chinese grand strategy. The third uh, would be uh, always, in every country, the kind of leadership and leadership perceptions, right? So China is, you know, I, there's no pithy way of putting this. Uh, you know, I'm writing a book about uh, this topic. You know, China, I like to say, is, has three national identities. It's a civ civilizational... You know, it was more of civilization than a nation state for most of its history. Uh, civilizational empire, uh, it's a nation state. Uh, it's, it's embedded now in the global economy. It's got those three identities. And it's still run by a, a Leninist party that in many ways uh, has become, the, par you know, the, the party has become again more important than the state governing institutions and so forth. The state owned enterprises have become more important than the private sector, uh, which was not true in the 1990s. So the quality of the leadership, and you see some of the leaders there waving at you, uh, you know, and, and their perceptions of, 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 of both what they want to do and the threats they face uh, importantly and significantly impact Chinese grand strategic thought and strategic thinking. So Xi Jinping, the current leader, uh, came in uh, to power ascended to power when China was in somewhat of a political crisis 
Uh, there was a very charismatic leader who was contesting his leadership. His name was Bo Xi Lai. He ended up going to prison uh, on charges related to corruption and murder. But the, the, party, the, the, the party that always said that its, its number one objective is to stay unified was showing, showing, showing some fractures when Bo Xi Lai contested uh, the leadership succession to Xi Jinping. So he came into power under conditions of more political contests, more political competitiveness than is usually the case under Chinese uh, uh, successions. Uh, that's number one, uh, with some powerful uh, allies, Bo Xi Lai had. And uh, number two is he came into China as its economy was starting to, to slow down. Now, now, China's economy is still probably growing at 6 or 7%. For most of the Western world, we'd say that's not a slowdown. Right? But for China, it is, uh, because it had double-digit growth for so long. And we could talk about the reasons for that slowdown, one of which is that it's incredibly indebted, actually. It's, it's got huge amounts of debt. Um, but anyway, he was coming in when, China, when China's resources were shrinking. And he had to face uh, political constraints. He had to face a decision about whether he would return China to market reform, the kind of market reform, let's say, in the 1990s that really allowed China to boom. Um, Instead, he decided on a mass anti-corruption campaign, on, on neutralizing political enemies, centralizing political power, uh, uh, and that does not, it's not conducive to economic reform and private sector growth. So um, his perception of the world is that it's quite hostile to him. If you read the Chinese and what he says about it, it's, it's, it's a struggle. It's a struggle with the United States. The United States is out to get. China and the Chinese Communist Party. It's a struggle within because there's more uh, political dissent. It's a struggle within because he also came to power after some of the worst rioting and protests in the Muslim majority areas. Uh, I guess they're not majority anymore. But Muslim dominated areas of, of uh, Xinjiang and, uh, and the rioting and, and so forth that you probably all read about in Tibet as well. So really kind of felt besieged uh, the, the, the greater Chinese empire, if you will, was, was causing a lot of problems. So he, he sees threats within and without and, uh, and, and is acting accordingly. So internally, he's uh, taking, taking down a lot of very big political players in his anti-corruption campaign, uh, big allies uh, of Bo Xi Lai, who who run this, ran the security services. And China, when you run the security services, it gives you a lot of opportunity to uh, uh, engage in all manner of corruption. So, so one of the people that he, that he imprisoned, Zhou Yongkong, uh, was, um, was, was not just the head of the security services, but his, his family oversaw an oil empire. And uh, that, was, that was a big deal to take someone like that down, because uh, one of the promises to the Chinese uh, Communist Party elites to stay together was that they would be immune from these kinds of prosecutions, if you will. Um, but anyway, so, so the leadership quality of Xi Jinping is, is that he certainly wants to project more of a strongman, kind of Putin-esque figure. I'm not sure he is, but that's what he wants to protect, project. And, you know, that means, uh, um, you know, that means uh, more, shall we say, assertiveness on the world stage. Uh, kind of continuing with the policies of, of, of building up uh, islands in the South China Sea and militarizing them, continuing with, with uh, the strategies of trying to uh, dilute U.S. influence in maritime East Asia, continuing with the policies of, of made, making greater gains in the Indian Ocean all the way to uh, parts of Africa and, and the Middle East. Uh, so I think, I sh I think Xi, Xi Jinping is dead serious when he says, I'm going to bring the CCP into uh, the part. The, my leadership is going to lead China into actual uh, national rejuvenation and, and put it on a par with other with other great powers. So uh, the you know the, the again the threat the threat perception of leaders. Uh, and, you know, a, as you can see, that's not all he's thinking about. He's you know he's thinking about possible massive trade tensions with the United States and trying to keep. You know, the economy, the economic relationship stable. He's now thinking about the North Korea summit, and, and there's been some cooperation there. So I don't mean to paint a picture of complete rivalry on every issue. Uh, but, um, but, you know, that I think he thinks more than his predecessors that, that he can really bring China into 
greatness, however, however defined. Uh, so leadership quality would be the third factor uh, in, in, um, in Chinese grand strategy, grand strategic thinking. The fourth is this kind of amorphous, um, this amorphous concept that a lot of international relations scholars and, 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 and strategists like to talk about, which is strategic culture. And that basically means you know, what, what do countries pull from their strategic traditions from the past that apply to the, to the present. If you look, if you study, let's say, modern Chinese history, by modern I mean 1641, the last dynasty, uh, you know, you see certain things that have remained in certain ways. There was, there was uh, mass uses of, of violence and force to conquer uh, the continental uh, land mass because of fights with the Mongols and, and so forth. But the other part of it was not massive uses of force. It was this processes of signification, where signification essentially meant that with the uh, states surrounding China, the Koreans and the Vietnamese and so forth, uh, under the dynasty, it was really getting the elites of those countries to buy into uh, the Confucian moral order and and see that China uh, represented kind of the uh, you know the apex of that and and to pay tribute to China in that way. Now, I'm not saying that's exactly what China is trying to reestablish necessarily, or is it possible to reestablish that? But those two you know, threats of force or the uses of force and softer processes of signification or coming to appreciate China as a, as a great civilization, I think, are two strategic themes we see uh, throughout Chinese history and, and I can still uh, see today in many respects. So it's not just the hard hand of military power that China is using today. Uh, it's also, uh, let's build Confucian institutes throughout uh, countries, uh, the United States, and Australia, and other places. Let's try to kind of sell people on our culture and 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 on our, you know, supposed benignness and and how we'll do things differently if we do become the hegemon, and the United States doesn't. Um, so, you know, that's Chinese grand strategy or grand strategic thinking in a nutshell. Um, I think that in order to uh, dilute U.S. power, uh, it's very complicated to do. I'm not saying it's. I'm not saying that it's. It's going to be accomplished anytime soon. You'd really have to break the alliances, which is so key to U.S. power in the region. So you'd really have to somehow break the U.S.-Japan alliance, U.S.-South Korea alliance, U.S.-Philippine alliance, U.S.-Thai alliance, U.S.-Australia alliance. And not 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 so easy to do. The U.S. is also developing partnerships with India and, and other places. But you know, the, I think the feeling among many in the Chinese elite, the grand strategists and Chinese elite is that over time you can kind of wait the United States out and convince the region that you've been here, this is your neighborhood, the United States is a guest, it's not, it's not a resident Asian power, and eventually it'll just kind of not see the need anymore to be around, and you can convince the, reg the region of that uh, as well. And, and, and there are regional concerns all the time about U.S endurance and staying power, uh, and so forth. Okay, so we have a grand strategy in the United States of competing against this grand strategy. And uh, competing, you know, essentially means uh, putting your weaknesses, your strengths against the other country's weaknesses. Uh, and, and, you know, I, you could probably see in my presentation, I did not uh, present China as 10 feet tall. China has a lot of weaknesses. Um, you know, I'll just, uh, I think I'm, I'm running out of time, or do I have a few minutes? Okay, good. Okay, good. Yeah, okay, so, so what would a, an effective, you know, uh, competition from a U.S. perspective look like? I think I gave you some sense of what it looks like from, from China. Uh, I know I'm going to get questions about North Korea, so I'm going to, I'm going to leave those there, and those have competitive and cooperative elements, I think, with the US, between the US and China when it comes to the Korean Peninsula. But from the United States perspective, is obviously some of it is just defensive. I mean, you know, keep the alliances, strengthen the alliances. You know, if, if, if China, um, you, know, you know, dissuade China from thinking that they can be broken. Um, you know, the, the, the fact of the matter is that the Chinese have great military power and are using it, uh, I think, well from their perspective to get what they want in certain places, but you know, China has not 
fought a war since 1979, so real sort of combat experience uh, is, not, is not there anymore. Uh, you know, that can be a little tricky because, uh, because the Chinese can be very kind of enamored of their own new strength uh, without re really knowing what the costs of war are, you know, and, and you know, not having combat experience for so long, uh, you know, but having all this combat power can be tricky, but you know the U U.S. I think uh, you know the strategic approach is is to make sure that the alliances are strong to build new partnerships with some of the emergent Southeast Asian countries, Vietnam and, and Indonesia, uh, and so forth. But it, it is very competitive. I mean, when when the United States goes to to Indonesia, for example, and and tries to sign new defense agreements or economic agreements or, or so forth. The Chinese are usually right there after us, and and uh, you know with their own set of infrastructure plans and so on. And, and a lot of that is to is to, is to purchase you know purchase influence. Um, you know the United States. I would say one of the biggest things lacking in the United States statecraft right now, and has been since really the end of the Cold War is we no longer have any kind of strategic information agency. So to the, we, we got rid of the US information agency, which was part of the competition with the Soviets. I'm not saying this is anything like competition with the Soviets, but we have no way really of, a, of constantly highlighting what we're doing in the region that is positive, that is uh, helping with growth and, and so on. Uh, China has a very sophisticated uh, information capacity and, and can really highlight what it's doing with things like the One Belt, One Road and building infrastructure in certain places. The United States is doing quite a bit, but we have just no capacity anymore to sell ourselves uh, around the world and, um, you know, and, and, and highlight targeted information campaigns. That's probably the first thing I would do is change that and, and say, you know, we, you know we, we have got to have some kind of information capacity that both highlights things that we don't uh, think other countries would like about Chinese behavior, but also highlights our own behavior. This is absolutely true with Russia as well. We talk all the time about how we uh, got hit with a massive disinformation campaign in the United States. We have no strategic capacity to hit back, uh, you know, in, in any significant way. Uh, to these countries that are very vulnerable to, to just uh, their populations getting, you know, the truth about their governments. So uh, that's a very big problem in U.S. statecraft. Um, the, you know, the, the military competition, I think, I think, you know, the way we want it to end up uh, is, is essentially, from our perspective, you know, China thinking that the game's not worth the candle, so to speak. So rather than spending a lot of money on, on trying to expand its maritime capacity, you know, try to turn more inward, you know, try to, you know, shape Chinese choices, so to speak, so that it, it focused more inward on its mass uh, socioeconomic problems. And, and again, just think that, you know, at the end of the day, the United States and its allies will, will just be too, too strong and it's not worth it. You know, the United States can continue to provide China with the so-called public goods provisions of safe sea lanes and so forth. Um, you know, so, so I think that um, first we have to understand the elements that go into shaping Chinese grand strategy. I hope I provided some of those to you right now. And, um, and, and then we have to understand what some of their grand objectives are. And it's not good enough to say it's just keeping the party in power. I mean, that's, there's a lot of things, you know, people will say that, but that means a lot of things now. The party has, has kind of made its power coincident with national rejuvenation, which means a greater gl global role. Uh, and we need to, you know, we used to be good at certain things uh, that we don't even do anymore, like information, like certain kinds of aid and development finance that are private sector related. Uh, and we just don't do those things. We haven't done them in a long time. And um, so, um, you know, but I, again, you know, the, I think our purposes are not to get into a conflict with China, it's to keep the competition at a manageable level uh, and, and, and end up in a, in a sort of a negotiation where we kind of both decide what's acceptable behavior, but the things that sort of threaten us the most, the expansion into Maritime East Asia and the Western Pacific, uh, 
you know, become become less less threatening. Uh, why don't I end there? I'm sure there'll be a lot of a lot of questions. So uh, thank you very much. into the North Korea part of the uh, evening. Um, so, I mean, I've, I've been involved with this um, since I first got into government, where the second nuclear crisis began in 2001, 2002, uh, where we confronted North Korea with um, evidence that they had a second hidden program of, of highly enriched uranium. And North Korea responded by saying, yes, we do. And, and we're pulling out of the nonproliferation treaty, and we're breaking all the seals on on some of the reactors we agreed to, to freeze, and, and we're going to reprocess plutonium, and we were in full crisis again in 2002. Um, and back then, there was, there was a strong belief in the United States that, that China would definitely partner with us to get rid of uh, the nuclear weapons program, because they would be afraid that if, if North Korea went, nuclear, went completely to become a nuclear weapons state, then Japan and South Korea and, and Taiwan and, and the whole region would also. Uh, but I think, I think we've lost, uh, through, <laughs> through evidence, of that confidence that China will, you know, that our interests are convergent on that issue. Um, I, think, I think China would, would rather have, it's a, it's a question of priorities, right? It, they'd rather have what we're stating our policy is and has been for a long time, you know, complete, verifiable, irreversible destruction, dismantlement of all of North Korea's uh, strategic programs, but it can also live with them, and and um, you know it it it's a question of, for us it's been a question of how do you manipulate Chinese fears, so that you change the risk calculus, right? So, you say the status quo is actually risky, and because uh, China could live with the status quo for a long time, so uh, whenever we go on these like the maximum pressure campaign that you've heard. A lot about you know was was starting to to work in 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 North Korea and you have to be very careful. I mean you ha you have to credibly threaten military force without scaring your allies, right? But but China was scared, it was was really scared, and uh, and 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 same with same with Kim Jong Un, and it got them to the table. So so China went along with. China went along with some UN sanctions that we never thought they'd go along with to avert war, you know. And um, and you know the war on the peninsula is the worst outcome for everybody, but for China it was just unthinkable. So they actually they actually started to put the squeeze on North Korea in ways we didn't think they would, uh, you know, because they were fearful. And um, I just wonder if if we can keep that up as we're beginning to get into symmetry and so on. Um, I think now. China's shifting more into its its more um, traditional role on this issue of kind of uh, trying to get itself in concert with Kim Jong Un um, and saying kind of repeating their talking points about how uh, we can't do this too fast and it has to be uh, phased and it has to be action for all the words we heard in 2006 2007 also freeze for freeze action for action let's also talk about the U S nuclear arsenal. And so forth. So, I think I think there's there's going to be a lot of pressure by China to 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 lift the pressure. There's going to be maximum pressure to lift maximum pressure, and uh, it's already very hard to keep the sanctions in place in China, and and we're already seeing some evidence of of it breaking. So um, it's going to be tough. I mean, as soon as you start to engage, um, you know, it it, it the, the um, the rest of the world doesn't necessarily want to keep the pressure on, but that's how we got to the talks in the first place.
your description sounds a bit to me like the age-old concept of the Middle Kingdom. My question is about Chinese leadership. What do you think the reasons for and implications of the change in the tenure rules have for us and for China? Yeah, I mean, uh, first, I think, you know, it's perceptive on your part. I mean, the, the, the sense of being the Middle Kingdom is very strong, and, and uh, it, it doesn't just go away with time. You know, countries have views of themselves, I believe, that, you know, that don't, you know, that don't just go away because parties or regimes change. Um, yeah, I mean, Xi Jinping, you know, is playing with all the rules that Deng Xiaoping set up, right? I mean, we're talking about rules within an autocracy anyway, so they're easily changed, but Deng Xiaoping kind of set up uh, rules of more consensus-based leadership and absolute term limits, if you will, of 10 years. Uh, and, Deng, and Xi Jinping has played with almost all of those, so much less uh, consensus-based leadership, much more centralization, where he's the head of, of so many different, what they call leading groups that make policy, um, and, um, and then getting rid of you know, the, the succession limits so that he could stay on longer, uh, not, not pick an appointed successor. Um, and, and I just wonder if, you know, if, if he can manage these changes. So uh, he's made a lot of powerful enemies in doing so. And you know, the, the, the kind of consensus that kept, everyone thought that the CCP was gonna collapse when the Soviet Union collapsed, right? And the way it kept together was through these rules. And, and one was consensus-based leadership. The other was um, absolute immunity for party leaders to be corrupt. And he's taken that away too, right? And, um, and, and so I just wonder if, if he makes one or two mistakes, whether there won't be somebody kind of ready, you know, standing at the ready to, um, you know, to, to remove him and, and, and jump into power. Why did he do it in the first place? Well, he wants to stay in power. And, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, earlier in your talk, you spoke of Chinese weaknesses, but you didn't enumerate them. Oh, yeah. Could you yeah. please discuss this in some detail, uh, and particularly as it relates to uh, the rival rivalry uh, between the U.S. and China? Yeah, ab absolutely. So on the military front, I'd say lack of any combat experience, lack of any soldiers with combat experience, you know, you know which, which makes a huge difference uh, in combat, right? So the U.S., while it's true that the U.S. hasn't been in the kind of uh, combat that, that may be necessary for high-level naval and air force engagements, it's been in combat, that soldiers have been in combat for a long time. Um, so that, that, that's a big deal. So you, you, can, you can train more realistically, let's say, on combined and joint exercises, but it's, it's a big deal when you don't have that, um, that kind of experience in your officer corps. Uh, as well as the command culture. So if, you're, if, if the party's stronger now and you have party commissars you know, in, in just about every unit, uh, it raises questions about the professionalism of, of that particular unit, particularly when you're talking about doing exercises further afield in nuclear submarines and so forth. So I, I would say that those, those would be weaknesses. There, there's some very technical weak, uh, military weaknesses as well. In terms of internal socioeconomic problems, I mean, um, you know, high, high levels of indebtedness, you know, it's something like 270% of GDP or something like that at this point. It's, it's very high. Um, demographic problems, very big ones. So uh, it's, a, you know, shrinking labor force, elderly, um, you know, that, and, and it's not rich, you know, it, you know Japan is, 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 is shrinking, but it's rich, right? It's per capita, China is not, it's getting old before it's getting rich. So, you know, how much stress will there be on the fiscal resources of China if it wants to compete on the global stage, uh, but it has, um, you know, it has a, a very fast aging population without a lot of children to support it anymore because of the one child policy. And that's not even to mention the other part of the demographic nightmare, which is the uh, gender imbalance is almost like science fiction. I mean, you know, it's 
hundreds of millions of, of males, you know, who won't be able to find brides, and and the uh, because of the sex selective abortions and so forth during the one child pol policy, you know, and that nobody kn even knows how to think about that. I mean, you know, is it surplus males who aren't going to be at the top of uh, top of society, you know, and and uh, the kind of social problems you might get with, you know, with those particular issues. Uh, natural resource drains. I mean, so, you know, basic things like, um, uh, you know, the use of arable land. I mean, you see a lot of, you know, because of the pollution in the water supply. So, you know, the, the fact that China is more dependent on global agriculture, uh, including from the United States, is, is a weakness, you know, from a strategic point of view, uh, or buying up land to, uh, you know, in other places to, to do their farming. Um, you know, so, you know, that, that, that's just a few. And so when I say the United States, you know, you know, the preference for the, you know, a preferred outcome for the competition would be China focusing in inward you know, more on these internal problems rather than the outward, um, there's a lot to focus on. Maybe uh, accentuating the positive, uh, can you cite some recent su uh, Chinese successes in terms of pursuing their strategies and where you think that might precipitate others? Yeah, I mean, so I, I think they've gotten pretty close to, you know, effective control over the South China Sea, which is a very big deal. I mean, it's one of the three most important waterways. And so from the period of, say, 2009 to ne through now, the building of these artificial islands and, and the militarization of them, um, I mean, we, we certainly do freedom of navigation operations to make the point that, that these waterways are international waterways. but. You know, slowly but surely, uh, China is kind of getting its way on those territories that it claims that are theirs, and also making it more difficult for us to operate in that in that waterway, which is traditionally where we freely operated. Um, I point to that as a success. I think, from their perspective, right? I, I think the um, uh, I think the one belt, one road, while oversold in many respects, is, is uh, certainly buying political influence for China. Um, it's not quite the reordering of geoeconomics, I think, that they're selling it as. But, but um, you know, even money that doesn't seem like a lot to the United States or Europe, I mean, it's, it seems like a lot to Indonesia or Thailand or Malaysia or Bangladesh. Uh, so I think China's far more influential in those places than they used to be. Um, you know, those, those are just two areas of success. Um, obviously, China's econ economy is slowing down, but it's moving up the technological ladder. It's not necessarily innovating in the sense that we would think of, but it's, you know, it's, it's stolen or copied enough uh, um, U.S. and European technology, Japanese technology, where it's, it's certainly higher up the value chain than it used to be. So, you know, I think those are some very real successes. Thank you. Um, what do you think of the growing economic relationship between China and Russia? Is it viable? You know, I had down here, if I had more time, my whole list of how to compete, and, um, you know, the United States has not thought enough about Russia in the context of Asia. So understandably, we think of Russia in the context of Europe and in the context of attacking us, you know, through information and cyber campaigns. But, the, you know, the Indians and the Japanese are extremely concerned about how close China and Russia are getting. And we should probably pay a little bit more attention to that. And so Russia is now the number one uh, uh, crude oil supplier uh, to China. It's it jumped past the Gulf states. And uh, I didn't think that was going to happen because Russia would essentially have to agree to become a junior partner to China in order for that to happen. Because China is going to make a huge capital investment in Russian oil fields and in Rosneft and so forth. So that's, that's growing. Um, and, uh, you know, it's always been sort of strategic writ for the United States that we don't want China and Russia too close, and it, it's happening. 
Um, so, uh, and, and by the way, you know, we're, we're automatically sanctioning uh, some of our partners for uh, doing military business with Russia. So India, some of the countries we want to win over, India, Vietnam, Indonesia, it's an automatic legislative sanction on these countries, right? And, and we, they may get waivers, but, so we got, you know, Russia, I haven't thought enough about Russia, but I think everyone who wants to understand China needs to, because it's, it's there's the Russia that we see incredibly aggressive in, in, in Europe and in the Middle East and, and in the United States, and then there's the Russia that's kind of becoming China's junior partner. So my question is, I'm reading uh, Ronan Farrow's book right now, War on Peace. I'm not sure if you're familiar with it, but basically it makes the argument that the U.S. has shifted increasingly towards an excessive focus on resolving international issues through military means as opposed to diplomatic means. And there's been an influx of resources to the Pentagon and outflow of resources from the State Department, USAID, et cetera. With China doing all these initiatives like One Belt, One Road, Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, et cetera. What can the U.S. do to counteract China's growing role around the world that is not military but diplomatic? And is there any chance that there's actually going to be any focus on this alternative strategy? Yeah, it's a good question. It's Rosa Brooks's book, right? Oh, okay. All right, yeah. Um, I mean, we need resources for both, you know? I mean, you can't have good diplomacy without, you know, a strong military, and, uh, and there's no point in a strong military without good diplomacy. And, and our military was starved, you know, under sequestration for a long time. And if we're going to maintain our global commitments around the world, you know, we need, we need resources for our military. But we definitely need resources for the State Department should not be cut in its budget. In fact, it, it, there's certain parts of it that should be upped. You know, one, one, one part, as I mentioned before, is strategic information, uh, some sort of information agency. And that's one way to counter BRI, because there's a lot of things that, that countries' recipients don't like about BRI. You know, the debt financing, um, you know, the, the trade-offs they have to make. You could take the Sri Lankan port for, as an example. You know, Sri Lanka is essentially in debt to, to China and has to give a lot when it comes to sovereignty, you know, where China wants to build ports and so forth. So highlighting some of the things that countries already don't like is, is, would be enormously impactful. We can't, you know, we have a lot of countries coming to us, including our ally Japan, saying, you know, why can't you compete with Belt and Road? Well, we're a free market account economy. We never order our companies to go. The, the Chinese are ordering their state-owned enterprises to, you know, go to Pakistan. You know, it's not, it's not profitable, but build a railway there and we'll draw down on our reserves. You know, we can't do that. We don't do that. You know, we, we, we try to create uh, and facilitate trade and market conditions, you know, so that our companies will be more active. Uh, but uh, I will say that we are still the number one recipient of, of, um, of foreign direct investment from China and from a lot of the Asian countries. Um, and uh, I think we have some proposals um, uh, right now to build up things like the Overseas Private Investment Council into something called the Defense uh, Financing, a uh, sorry, the Development Financing Agency. So we're looking a lot more at develop development finance that catalyzes private sector growth because, you know, that's just more along the lines of, of, of how we do things and frankly how the Europeans do things also. They're concerned about One Belt, One Road. Does that answer your question? Thank you. Thank you.